Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Front Range. My name is Johnny. I'm one of our pastors. So glad to be with you this morning. Uh, This is a place where we hope that you can build community, discover your purpose, and grow in your faith in Jesus. And if it's your first time at Front Range, whether you're watching online or you're here in the room or the courtyard with us, we're so glad that you're with us. Please take a next step and get connected today. There is a lot going on at Front Range, and we want you to know about it. Uh, I want to follow up from what Addison said a couple seconds ago and, and just point your attention towards next Sunday. We're starting a new series on the book of Colossians that is going to be both challenging and extremely encouraging uh, in our faith, and so please join us for that. But it also is man day here at Front Range, and I can confirm we will have bacon, we will have donuts, um, and we are going to have one of the coolest giveaways we've ever had as a church, and I'm not going to spoil it, but if you're a dude and you hear me, you want to be here. You want to win this giveaway. I promise you. Uh, So please join us next week. Today we are finishing up our series on emotions, and this has been an amazing series. I have been challenged. Um, I love the topics that we've talked about. I love getting to finish the series today, and we're going to talk about something that I believe every single person wants more of in their life, and that is joy. Now, throw your hand up with me in the chat, throw, your hand, throw a hand emoji, whatever, if you want more joy in your life. I think every single person, we're like, yeah, I want to be more joyful. I want more joy in my life. And I often, I, I think of my children when I think about joy. When, when we first started talking about this topic, I was like, yeah, kids. Kids just seem to be so full of joy. Like my one-year-old, um, he seems to like forget who I am when I'm gone at work. Right, And then when I come home at the end of the day, he's like, that guy, I like that guy. That guy's cool, yeah. And like, you can just see it on his face where he's like, this dude. Or uh, like my, my daughter, she's three. And a couple of weeks ago when it was real rainy and kind of gross outside, she got so pumped when my wife told her she could go play in the rain. It was like, like, we, it was like Christmas all over. It's like, I can play in the rain? Are you kidding me? And I'm like sitting inside grumbling. Like it's cold outside. It's gross, all that kind of stuff. But like she's just so full of joy. And children just seem to have that, right? There's just, it doesn't matter what's happening. doesn't matter what's going on. They can find something to be joyful about. But something happens to us as we get older. We get beat up a little bit. The world kind of takes a toll on us. And I want to talk about biblical joy today and how we can discover that in our lives, how we can cultivate that in our lives. Um, my, my daughter, she, when, when she gets like a, a bump or a bruise or a scrape or something, we call those battle scars. You know, they're running around outside and they get like a battle scar. Uh, she calls them battle cars. And so she's happy to show you her battle cars if you want to ask her. But that happens to all of us. We all get battle cars in our life. The world beats us up a little bit and it steals our joy. And the definition of joy that I want to use today through my study of, of scripture and, and just this topic in general, here's what I found that scripture des, uh, describes as joy. Joy is a deep, inward cheerfulness, calm delight, or gladness. It's a deep, inward cheerfulness, calm delight, or gladness. How many of us could say, man, I I could use some of that in my life? But where does that joy come from? And how can we, as as it says in James chapter 1, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds? When we get battle cars... When we face trials, when the world is not fun or easy or happy or glad or delightful or cheerful, when things in our lives don't go the way we want them to, how can we consider it pure joy? In 2018, my grandfather took his own life, and I have struggled with this topic. How can I consider It pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever we face trials like that. How can we live with what we see in Scripture? We see that we're told that we can have joy, that it is possible to have this inward joy, and yet how? As we talk about this today, I I don't want to communicate and I don't want you to hear that we have to pretend that everything's okay or that we have to fake it until we make it. I want us to discover the true source of joy and I want us to be able to experience the joy that God promises us that is a fruit of God's spirit. If you're, belie- if you're a believer and you have God's spirit living within you, there are certain fruit, that, that there is fruit that comes from his spirit and joy is one of the fruit. 
a, a piece of the fruit of God's spirit. We're told that we can have joy. If you have a Bible, turn to uh, 1 Peter. It's all the way towards the end of the New Testament. We're going to look at uh, a couple of verses in this letter. It's written by, can anyone guess? 1 Peter is written by? Peter, thank you very much. There you go. I was just making sure you're awake. It's just like the easiest test in the world. So it was written by Peter. He's, uh, he's writing to a group of Christians that are kind of spread out all over Asia Minor during this time. It's around the middle of the first century. And Peter is writing from the vicinity of Rome. He's somewhere around Rome. Now, why do I tell you that? Because it matters. Uh, the context that Peter was writing from and in, it matters and it informs what he says to the Christians that he's writing to and what we can learn about joy in this situation. The, the letter is sort of a preparation or a response to suffering and persecution that was either happening or starting to happen or it was really coming uh, depending on the time frame that he wrote it in. So again, Peter's writing from the vicinity of Rome. And around that time, uh, the Roman Emperor Nero started to really uh, intensely persecute Christians. Now, Nero, um, if you don't know much about him, that's fine. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. He was horrible. He was <laughs> terrible. Uh, Tacitus was a first century historian. He writes about this time period, and he said that Nero would uh, have Christians be torn apart by dogs, and that he would nail them to crosses and light them on fire to be lampstands in the city. So... Have that in your mind. This is the kind of guy that was coming into power and was starting to do some of these things. But at the, the same time, these Christians living in Asia Minor were uh, being ostracized and sort of cast out and, and experiencing a little bit of persecution. We don't know exactly how bad it was for them yet at the time of this letter. But I, what I want you to hear is that persecution, suffering was happening and it was coming. And that informs a bit of what Peter tells us in this letter. So 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 3. Peter writes, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Pause there. Never perish, spoil, or fade, no matter what's coming. No matter what you're going to face, it will never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. In all what? In all of the things he just said. And all of the great things that he just said, that we have an inheritance that is kept for us in heaven. It's not here on the earth. It's not going to perish, spoil, or fade, or be taken away from us by men like Nero or any of the kind of stuff that we are going to face. And it's because of the resurrection of Jesus. Peter is pointing to our hope in Jesus, who died on the cross for us, who rose from the dead, who ascended into heaven, who will come, who will return to fix this whole mess. Our, our inheritance and our hope is in him, and we greatly rejoice. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. It's important to know here, that, that phrase, for a little while, it, if you read it, it may be a little offensive. Peter, are you, are you trying to minimize what I'm going through? And no, he's not at all trying to minimize the pain that we face, the difficulties, the trials, the divorce, the miscarriage, the loss, fill in the blank. Peter is not trying to minimize that at all. What he's trying to do is say, in light of what Jesus has done for us and in light of eternity, this life is a little while. And I get it. We have suffered and we will suffer, but it's for a little while. And the hope that we have, the future that's coming, the resurrection of Jesus, the eternity that he's promised us is so much better. He's trying to point our eyes to that. And we're going to come back to that and talk about it more in a bit. Verse 7. These trials have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have seen him, you love him. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and here we go, are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Remember here, 
Peter was not writing to a group of Christians who were not struggling. He was not writing as a person who was not struggling himself. No, they were very much in the midst of trials and suffering and hardship. And yet he tells us that believing in Jesus, believing in all of these things, this great inheritance, we can be filled with a glorious and inexpressible joy. And here's that tension, though, that we live with. Joy in the midst of suffering and trials. So how do we experience this joy? I want to share some things that I've learned in my own journey, some things I've learned from Scripture, and watching joy-filled people that I've seen in my life and I've gone, I want whatever they have, right? You know those people. It's like, how, how did they do this? How did they have something that's going on in here that no matter what happens, they can't be shaken? The joy that they have cannot be taken away from them. That's what I want to talk about. Here's what I've learned. Joy-filled people, first, are, they plant roots in God's Word, and in his presence. Joy-filled people plant roots in God's word and his presence. They, they plant their roots down deep. They anchor their hope in God's word, which reveals his character, his faithfulness, his promises, and they spend time in his presence. They've learned to lean into that living hope that Peter talks about. It's not just something that they do either. It's a way of life. It's a lifestyle of rhythms that help their roots grow down deep. It's not a task to accomplish. Think about the roots of a plant, right? Just think about what they do and how they matter to a plant. They seek out water and nutrients, and they also provide anchorage deep into the ground so that when storms come, they cannot be shaken or uprooted or taken away, right? Roots dig down deep so that they can endure harsh conditions. And I, I learned a lot about roots a couple of years ago. We're going to throw some pictures here on the, on the screen. Uh, a couple of years ago, we discovered through a, a few very messy circumstances that I won't go into that the uh, apple tree in our front yard was finding its sustenance from our sewage pipe. So uh, that resulted in several thousand dollars of expenses, uh, eight feet of brand new glorious looking pipe uh, in, our, in our front yard, and uh, I came to realize later, poop apples, right? Think about it for a second. Where's the tree getting its nutrients? I'm going to let that sit with you. Our staff really wanted me to say pooples, <laughs> which I have now said. So there we go. Here's the thing about roots. They will find the nutrients they need or the plant will die. They have to go somewhere. And it's the same with the roots of our souls and the roots of our hearts. They have to go somewhere to be nourished and to be fed. And the problem that we have in our lives is that there are no shortage of options provided by the world and provided by culture to nourish us. And yet those options are poisonous and they are destructive and our challenge, the challenge of walking with Jesus is uprooting the roots of our lives and planting them somewhere intentionally, like God's word and his presence. And I have had to discover that this is not a quick fix. It's not a task list. It's not a checkbox. It is a way of life. We cannot expect to dip a tree in soil once a week and have it be healthy and grow. We can't. It's not what we're called to. It's not what God offers us. It's not the way of Jesus. And we have precious little time to spare in our day, and it is far, far too easy to let that time be stolen away by scrolling social media, watching The Office for the 40th time, any number of things. And that, I'm not trying to shame anyone. I'm right there with you. I have to regularly go through periods of, like, I'm deleting Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Get it off my phone. Get it out of here. Like, all of that stuff, it steals our time. And the challenge that I'm putting before us is that we have to be intentional with where our roots are planted, where the root systems of our lives are finding their nourishment and their source of life. We have to be intentional with that. I've been able to implement a few practices in my life over the last couple of years to help me slow down. How many of us could use some slowing down? with the way that our lives are going, to be with Jesus, to engage more with God, to put rhythms in place to help my roots go deep in God's word and in his presence. And I want to just recommend a book to you if you're interested, if this sparks your interest at all, if this series on emotions has stirred anything in your heart, I want to recommend a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. There's a, there's a website that we have, frontrange.info. There's a tab that says resources on there. Click that tab. And there's a link to the book on there. So I, I want you to remember the website to get there, frontrange.info. 
Go to the resources tab. This book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, has the, the practices and the things that I've implemented have changed my life. Um, I can't overstate that. I'm not exaggerating. The things that I've learned, the things that I've put in place have changed my life. And they have helped me create these rhythms. It's not revolutionary stuff. It's actually ancient stuff that our, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ have been doing over hundreds of years, sitting in silence in God's presence, allowing him to speak to the, the innermost places of our hearts. These rhythms and these things that I've put in practice have changed my life. So I want to recommend that to you. If you need a starting place of like, yes, my roots, what do I do? Check out that book, frontrange.info. Go to the resources tab there. This is, this is just a starting point, though. This is the first thing, the top priority that I've learned from joy-filled people, that they plant their roots in God's word and in his presence. And another thing that I've learned about joy-filled people, they, they seem to be active with their faith. And I, I, I want to put it this way. Joy-filled people live with purpose. Joy-filled people live with purpose. I, I want to I challenge all of us after today to read the entire book of 1 Peter, the entire letter. Now, don't get, don't get worried. It will literally take you 15 minutes. If you're a fast reader, 10. If you're a slow reader like me, 15. It is a short letter. The reason I want to encourage you to do that is because Peter, throughout the rest of the letter, puts purpose around these topics that we're talking about. He challenges us to do a couple of things, to be active with our faith, and he gives us a picture of what this looks like. He challenges us to holiness in our walk with Jesus, to put off sin, to turn from our sin, and live in the power of the Holy Spirit to be more like Jesus. He also challenges us to love one another, to serve one another, to submit to one another, and to find purpose in our lives. Remember, he's talking to a group of battered, beat-up people who are about to experience some intense persecution. He knows it's coming. He sees it coming, and yet he's trying to help them ground their faith in Jesus and live in faithfulness. So I want to encourage you to read the letter, because putting purpose around our lives helps elevate our perspective from our own, from our own stuff. And helps us see that we are part of a bigger story. That God is doing something bigger with our lives and that we can be a part of it. And we can find joy in the purpose that God has for us. I was talking to a friend recently who struggles with uh, depression and, and doubt. And they have done hard work in these areas. Um, seeking counseling, pushing forward, studying the Bible, praying. All of the things that uh, if you were sitting with a person like that, you'd say, well, have you done all of this? It's all, yes, Absolutely. And yet they're still struggling. It's still hard sometimes. But in our conversation, the thing that stood out to me was the sense of purpose and joy that they find from raising their children. That the thing that, that stood out to me, even in seasons of darkness or depression, is the purpose that they feel God has giving the, given them in raising these children to know and follow Jesus. And even on the worst days, that hope is there that they're part of something bigger, that God is using their story, he is using their life to make a difference. True purpose, God's purpose for our lives, brings joy. And it comes from a belief system rooted in the gospel, rooted in God's word, and it helps us see that we are part of this bigger story. Understanding that Jesus died for me, that I give my life to him, that I am no longer my own, that I belong to him and he's called me to be a part of his story in the world, that he's given me something to do to love people, to help people, to serve them, to bring his kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. We are part of that. And when you understand this, when you, when you get a, a picture of this, your entire life takes on a whole different meaning. Your marriage takes on a bigger purpose when you realize that we represent God and his love for the church, Jesus and his bride, the church, that we get to be a picture of God's relationship with us, that we get to represent him to the world. Your job takes on a whole different meaning no matter what you do. When you realize that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, God has called you to love people and to serve people and to be there for them, to share what he has given to you, what he's done for you. Your job takes on a whole different meaning when you understand that God has a purpose for you, that he's put you in that place to be an example of his love and his grace. We have an, we have an opportunity to make a difference in our daily lives and in the people that we interact with. We have purpose. There's also purpose found in the community of the church. We're meant to engage in one another's lives in community, to serve one another, 
to be there for one another, to carry each other's burdens. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're told that as we are comforted by the Holy Spirit, as we seek him in the difficult parts of our lives and he comforts us, we are then to comfort one another with the comfort that we've been given. We are to turn that and give it to one another. Sometimes your greatest purpose can be found in your deepest pain. Sometimes your greatest purpose can be found in your deepest pain. God's purpose for our lives helps us find meaning. It helps us focus on something and someone other than ourselves, and it helps us realize that we are a part of his bigger story that has an ending where God wins, where he is in control and everything's going to be okay. This leads me to the final thing that I've learned about joy-filled people. Joy-filled people find hope in the already and the not yet. Joy-filled people find hope in the already and the not yet. I realize that's a goofy sentence. Let me explain. There is a tension between what God has already done, what he has already promised, what he has said is going to happen, and what has not happened yet. Right? We know this. We read scripture and we go, yeah, Revelation sounds really cool. New heaven, new earth. God wipes away all the tears. No more sorrow. And yet, here I am. You read Psalms and you hear David crying out to God and proclaiming some of the most beautiful things about God and his glory and how he's going he, to do good things. And yet you also see David struggling and going, this sucks. Joy-filled people have found hope in that tension. To be able to put our faith and our hope in a God who says he will wipe away every tear. That he sits on the throne. That he is in control. And that in the end he will win. Remember what Peter said in verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. That's the tension that Peter's pointing to. We suffer for a little while. And yet, we know, we believe, we struggle to believe, we fight to believe that God's going to win. Joy-filled people recognize that tension and they place their hope and their joy in what God has promised and what he is going to do. A hope that's driven by a belief and a faith in a God who raised Jesus from the dead. Everything points to the resurrection of Jesus. That if, if Jesus was raised from the dead, everything's going to be okay. If, and I say if because that's where you have to believe. If Jesus was raised from the dead, and I believe he was, everything's going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. The unique perspective of Christianity is that we can place our hope in that coming future. And Jesus warned us about this. In John chapter 16, verse 33, he told his disciples, I've told you these things. He was warning them so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. It's a guarantee. It's a, it's a promise. You will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Peace and trouble. Right next to each other. Right there in the words of Jesus. And yet, that peace is there. And it's found where? In him. I can tell you from experience, as I have struggled through this journey and, and dealt with tough stuff, that in him there really is peace. That a moment in his presence can change your entire outlook, your entire perspective. This morning, as I was preparing for this, I was reading something completely unrelated in, in the Gospels and just reading Jesus teaching and I, I got up and walked away and thought, man, the Bible is so good. And God, you are so good. The things that you're trying to get me to do to follow you, the things that you're calling me to is so good. Your way is better than my way. God, help me. And I left that moment just thinking, thank you. You changed my perspective. Joy-filled people plant their roots in God's word and his presence. They live with purpose and they find hope in the already and the not yet. It would be easy for me to preach this message and pretend that I've got all this figured out and that I am the most joy-filled person you've ever met, and yet those who know me well know that as a lie. <laughs> Ask them. They clearly know. I still get sad. 
thinking about my grandfather. I still get angry. I still have questions. I struggle. But God has been so faithful and present in my life. (laughs) When I pick up this children's Bible that my grandfather gave to my daughter, it's got his initials on the, the letters there on the pages. He signed it on the inside cover. When I pick this up and I read it to my children, I get sad and I'm frustrated and I don't understand why. And yet, I have hope. Hope that we'll see each other again. Hope that God's gonna answer my questions, that everything's gonna be okay and I get to share the hope of Jesus with my children from the Bible that he gave us. That's what I'm talking about. This tension, this struggle that we live with. I want to refer back to that James passage I read at the, at the beginning. We're going to go a little further than what I read before, though. James chapter 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know, we believe, we know, that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Not lacking hope, not lacking peace, not lacking joy, not lacking anything. Let's pray. God, we ask for you to just be near to us in this moment, for you to speak to us. God, we come before you with all kinds of different trials and circumstances and messes and all sorts of stuff. The tension, the struggle between what you've promised, what we believe, and what we see. So God, I pray for every single person, every one of us, God, that you would show up in a real way. God, that you would speak to us that you would draw us in closer to you, Lord, that you would help us discover some rhythms and some things that we can put in place in our lives to plant our roots deep in your word, in your character, in your faithfulness, in your goodness, and in your presence. God, I'm so thankful that you invite us to be in your presence in prayer and in the stillness and that you speak to us, God. I know that every week as we're here worshiping together, there are some who join us and and maybe you've never made a a decision to follow Jesus before. And as we're in this moment, everybody just keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. I'm not not here to embarrass or, or call out anyone or ask you to do anything other than be willing to follow Jesus. He died for you. He died a death on the cross he did not deserve for your sin, to pay the price for your sin. And he rose from the dead three days later, proving himself to be all-powerful and over everything. He conquered sin and death to provide eternal life for us. So again, as everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you're here this morning and you say, I need to follow Jesus, I need that. I need the joy that he's offering. I need him in my life. Maybe you've made that decision before and life's gotten in the way and you want to return home. I want to include you as well. I want to pray for you. All I want to ask you to do is be willing to slip your hand up so I can pray for you this morning. So if that's you, go ahead and do that so I can pray. Father, we thank you that no matter how many times we go astray, no matter how many times we turn and try to to do life our own way, God, you are there with open arms. And that you're waiting for us as a father who loves his children. God, we give you our lives. We trust you for salvation. God, we know that we can't earn it ourselves. We know that we can never be good enough because we've tried. So God, we trust you to save us. Help us walk in your ways. Help us to live this out, to learn more about you, to learn to follow you in our lives, God. And we thank you so much in Jesus' name.